Hello everybody, I am back for another video and this one we're going to start actually talking about you know existing databases and actually apply some of the knowledge that we've hopefully learned in some of the last few videos. Uh, so the first channel announcement I have to quickly make is that I'm almost at 100 subscribers which uh, you know the second I get there I can actually quit my job because it means that I've actually become a full-time influencer I'm pretty sure that's how it works. But um, yeah, in the meantime, until I get that 100th subscriber, let's talk about some of the pitfalls of relational databases. Um, a lot of people will use the term SQL and NoSQL, and I don't particularly like doing that because not all relational databases use SQL. Um, NoSQL is a super broad term. I prefer non-relational databases, but even within non-relational databases, there are graph databases, key value stores, wide column databases, and other options too. So keeping all of that in mind, um, I'm just going to use the terms relational and non-relational for now, and this video is generally going to be about why relational databases are not always the answer, and then in subsequent videos I'll do more of a case study on some of the other options that we have to implement. Okay, let's talk about the pitfalls of relational databases. Well, for me to talk about why something is bad, I must first talk about what it actually is. Let's talk about the background. So relational databases are comprised of tables that hold a bunch of rows of structured data. That means they're using a predefined schema, which means that all of the columns have been predefined on the table creation. And until you do some sort of alter table or, or use like an optional field or something like that, the schema generally stays co uh, constant, which makes it a little bit hard to adapt. Additionally, the whole point of this is that the rows of one table can have relationships with rows of another table if they share a common key. That key is generally known as a foreign key. And then finally, there is a built-in query optimizer that returns results using the declarative SQL language. What is a declarative language? It means that basically you're going to type in the format or of the result of the query that you want. So basically saying, I want to select everything from this table and provide me with this type of information too. And then this query optimizer is going to say, okay, I know the result that he wants. Let's go ahead and now do that the most efficient way possible using a combination of indexes, parallelism, and a bunch of other things under the hood. So in this way, relational databases are a little bit of a black box. The most popular relational databases that um, you might have heard of are probably MySQL and PostgreSQL. Okay, here are some other implementation details. Generally speaking, they use B-trees. We've spoken about B-trees in the first episode on this channel, and if you recall, that means you're writing and reading from disk. Additionally, they support tr transactions using two-phase locking. This is another thing we've spoken about on the channel. And then finally, all reads and writes go to disk. Okay, let's talk about actually scaling a relational database. So traditionally, most people scaled their relational database vertically. What that means is instead of actually just using more uh, nodes to put the database on, what they went and did is just use a more powerful machine. This led to things like mainframes. Now, however, everyone wants to do cloud computing, which means that we have a bunch of generic computers located in data centers, which we can rent out and use a certain amount of compute units if we want. So everyone wants to scale horizontally. That means that we're just scaling on generic hardware, like I said. So, as a result of that, generally speaking, we have to end up sharding or partitioning our SQL tables. This is where things honestly start to get challenging. Okay, so let's go into some problems with sharding. First, I'm going to talk about the problems with sharding on writes. So imagine that we have um, you know, a, a single leader replication setup for each shard. And I am going to be Venmo, and I want to transfer $1,000 from Putin to Trump. That's actually a typo who are on different partitions. So here's what's going to happen is I have those guys on different partitions and then I'm going to create this transaction. And it's going to say Trump balance increased by $1,000, Putin balance uh, decreased by $1,000. However, what if it happened to be the case that only one of those network requests actually reached the proper partition? Trump, say, gains $1,000, but Putin never loses his. And then me, as Venmo, I lose $1,000 because I just messed up my transaction. So in order to do so, we need to make sure that the operation either succeeds on both partitions or fails on both. But this is over the network, so we're no longer just using a single computer level transaction. Now what we're doing is something called a distributed transaction. And I'll actually get into how we might do this in a future video, but for now, all I'm going to say is that distributed transactions, since they have to get both of these nodes to agree on doing something, 
is going to use a lot of network resources and is going to be much slower than just a single computer transaction. As a result, writing to multiple partitions at once in a transactional way can be very slow. Okay. Continuing with the problems of sharding, now let's look at what happens when we want to do a read. Let's imagine I'm using Facebook Messenger, and I want to see all of the chats that I'm in. So I'm Jordan, and my user ID is 1. So according to this many-to-many -many relationship table, which I'll just call user chats, I now see that as user 1, I'm a member of chats with ID 1, 3, 5, and 7. So you can see those two partitions below where the chats are located. So the first partition holds chat IDs from 1 to 4, and the second holds chat IDs from 5 to 8. As you can see, I'm going to actually have to query both partitions to find uh, all of the chats that I'm in and then aggregate those results. The fact that I have to make multiple network calls is again problematic. Why? Well, because one of them could fail and then I would have an incomplete query. Or just in the more general case, the fact that I have to do multiple of these queries means that things are going to take longer. Network requests are always uh, bad and you want to minimize them when you can. Okay. So now that brings me to kind of the relational philosophy, because we'll see how, in many ways, this can kind of scale poorly. Every single piece of data has only one copy. We want to normalize data, not denormalize it, so that that way, if we make a change to one piece of data, which a bunch of other pieces of data reference, that change is now going to be propagated. So that's kind of the idea of reducing duplication. Secondly, each table has one preset schema. This allows you to kind of encode data better, and in addition to that, it just makes for simplifying things into one easy-to-use table. Uh, thirdly, we're going to fetch related data via joins. A join in a relational database is basically saying, OK, I have one thing. Let's call it, um, I don't know, a profile. Uh, think about it like a LinkedIn profile. I have a LinkedIn profile, and then all of my job listings are going to be in a job listing table. And each job listing has a user ID, which shows that it corresponds to my profile, because those are my experiences. You know, it says like, oh, I worked at Amazon, now I'm working at Google, and now it's going to have the user IDs of um, myself on there. So joining is basically saying, take all of those rows with the corresponding user ID and fetch them. So that's how you would, uh, you know, continue to kind of work into that idea of reducing data duplication. Finally, we're going to hide concurrency bugs and partial failures via abstractions, in this case, transactions. OK, why is this problematic? Well, for starters, the second that sharding gets involved, um, all of this data splitting becomes super problematic. We have to make a bunch of network calls, um, both on reads and on writes, on writes for distributed transactions, and on reads in order to basically go ahead and um, aggregate results from a bunch of partitions. Um, additionally, to actually just have transactions on a single node requires something like two-phase two locking, which can be very slow because it means that reads and writes can actually block one another. Finally, the B trees that all of these relational databases use because they've been around for so long and basically that's all that existed was B trees are very slow for writing compared to some in-memory buffer like an LSTM tree. Okay, so what if we want to move away from relational databases? Um, there's this term, NoSQL, that you probably have heard by now, and generally what that means is a non-relational database. So in reality, NoSQL databases aren't the opposite of SQL or anything. It's really just taking a database as we know it and stripping down a bunch of these features and abstractions that are part of a SQL database, which is basically a black box. And once you strip down these features, it allows you to kind of increase performance while only taking kind of the features that you want. OK, so what are some of the design patterns of NoSQL? Well, most importantly, objects are generally going to be self-contained documents. What does that mean? It means there's more locality on disk. Everything that is related in data is going to be stored next to one another. So you know, if we're looking at my LinkedIn profile and I have all of these job experiences, instead of storing the job experiences in their own table, I would actually store those experiences, say, in something like a JSON document with my profile in general. So that would contain you know, a link to my profile image, um, a profile description, and generally everything is going to be stored together. This is good because sequential reads on disk are more efficient, and as a result, everything is going to be sequential and easier to read from and write to. This also makes things easier to shard. I can literally just split up the documents. It doesn't really matter which shard they're on, because at the end of the day, everything that that document is going to need is already with it. It's self-contained. Next, it's schemaless. This is really good for applications like machine learning, 
or any time you basically just want to dump a ton of data into a database without kind of worrying about formatting it or, or putting it in a way that it needs to fit into a given table. It's also really good for maintainability because that means that your data can adapt over time in the event that you want to make changes to your data without having to add things like optional fields. And then finally, uh, the main pitfall of all this is data duplication. Let's say I'm using a NoSQL database and I have a document for a bunch of books in a library. Well, in an SQL database or a relational database, what you might do is, you know, each author would have an, uh, an object or a row in a table. And then if an author writes multiple books, each book can reference the same author via an author ID. In a NoSQL database, I might have to repeat that author information multiple times. Now let's say this author is actually still alive and decides to change their name or something. Now I'm going to have to go to every single book written by that author and change their name. So this could potentially take a lot of application side code, which is pretty unfortunate. In addition, while I did say that most NoSQL databases are self-contained documents, there are also NoSQL databases that are graph databases. And these are really good for many-to-many -many relationships, which those document databases are not very sufficient for. Document databases are generally good for when data is in self-contained documents, and there's not too many relations between the data. However, graph databases represent things like social networks really, really well because it allows you to put metadata with each node and link between the nodes. Those are also schemaless. Okay, so in conclusion for relational databases. Um, the real main benefit of relational databases is that a lot of people have experience with them, and as a result, they're very intuitive and people understand them well. People know how to do one-to-many relationships, they know how to do many-to-many -many relationships, and generally things make sense. However, the second you get sharding involved and you want to do some sort of horizontal scaling, things can go pretty poorly. You may have to use distributed transactions, and um, read joins can take a really, really long time across multiple partitions. Additionally, the fact that by nature most of these relational databases use transactions is bad because two-phase locking can be very slow. Furthermore, B-trees are really slow for writes compared to things like LSTM trees, which go to memory. Additionally, the set schema makes the database hard to maintain in the long run in the event that your data is evolving. And then finally, generally speaking, these relational databases use single leader replication because it's kind of just more simple. And as a result of that, it limits your write throughput. So, you know, for write throughput increases, it tends to be the case that you want to use something like NoSQL. So, as a result, NoSQL databases have gained a lot of popularity because they relax a lot of these requirements used by relational databases. Even though this can definitely add some complexity to your code, you kind of have to look at the specific requirements of your application and decide what you need and you don't need. For example, if you're a bank, and you want to make sure that account balances are staying consistent and synchronized, you probably do need transactions, and a relational database is still the way to go. But for a lot of things like messenger services and social media apps, the increased write throughput and lack of need for complete consistency by NoSQL is actually a really good thing. Okay, furthermore, this doesn't mean that SQL is infeasible. Like I just said in that bank account example, it's still really useful. However, even if you just have a read-heavy application and highly related data, relational databases can still be good. Um, it's the case that just since everyone's so familiar with them, if you can get away with using a relational database, you probably should because it's just pretty simple to reason about the data. Additionally, many companies really like that kind of SQL interface but want to improve the underlying technology below it. And so there are things like VoltDB and Google Spanner, which have tried to improve the scalability of the relational model, and some people are calling that new SQL. And I'll talk about that in a later video as well. Um, another thing to note is there's no database that is perfect for every application. It's only by breaking down how each of them works that we can decide which one to use in a given situation. Okay, so I hope this makes sense why relational databases have kind of decreased in popularity a little bit, but overall, they're still super common. So at the end of the day, all we can really do is understand what a relational database is, and then also look at some possible other options like Cassandra or Couchbase or anything along those lines and see which is best for our application. If you're doing a systems design interview, being able to break down why you picked a given database is really huge. And as a result, I think the next few videos are gonna be really important.